It is good to be together again, studying the book of Revelation. We've been going through this book and understanding the, some of the depths of what the Bible is teaching, trying to focus in the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking again for just a moment at Revelation chapter 12 and a couple of verses there so that we can better understand chapter 13. So if you turn to Revelation chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 15 and 16 because one of the questions that I have is that the, the second beast comes up out of the earth. There's two beasts in Revelation 13. The first beast comes up out of the water. And my question is, with Revelation 12, verses 15 and 16, you, you see the water and the earth there, the two places where these beasts come forth from, the water and the earth. And so I want to see, is there a connection in Revelation 13 to this uh, image or picture of the water and the earth there in chapter 12? So verses 15 and 16 in Revelation chapter 12 say this, The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So you can see the dragon has water in his mouth. Okay? The first beast of Revelation 13 comes up out of the water. I would submit to you that both the dragon and the beast of Revelation 13, the first one, were drafting from the same water. And then, of course, in the verse 16, where the earth helped the woman, there's this other beast in Revelation 13 that comes up out of the earth. And that, of course, was the nation, the beast, that helped the woman. So I think what we're doing is in chapter 13, we're seeing a little bit of uh, a magnification of what's happening in chapter 12. So in chapter 12, there's a reference to the water and the earth. In chapter 13, there's a bigger reference to the water and the earth. So let's learn from Revelation 13 a little more of what's going on. In verse 11 of Revelation 13, the Bible says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. I'm going to do as much as I can to focus on my notes this time to be able to cover quite a bit of information. The notes can be found at revelationwithdaniel.com underneath the video, and all of the notes are underneath the videos that are already there. So this another beast, we know according to Daniel chapter 7 that every beast in Bible prophecy represents a nation. You can see that in Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 and 23. So the coming up out of the earth, the coming up is, is similar to other terms in the Bible where, the, where it's like springing up out of the water, etc. But this coming up actually refers to coming up out of the earth like a plant, slowly, progressively coming up out of the earth. It didn't spring up and all of a sudden appear. It's coming up out of the earth. And you know, the Strong's uh, Greek number is actually, it translates it arise, ascend, or climb up. That's uh, Greek number 305. So notice this beast didn't come up like a beast of prey. The beast of prey we can see in the first beast, which is a lion, a leopard, and a bear. This lion, leopard, and a bear is also pictured in Daniel chapter 7. And the bear, for example, has three ribs in its mouth, and it's told to arise and eat much flesh. And then, of course, the uh, leopard has the four heads, and the, the lion has got eagle's wings, and it's moving quickly. We know those are beasts that when they come to take their prey, they, they will pounce quickly and attack. Well, this beast, this second beast of Revelation 13, it springs up like a plant. It's not coming up like the beasts of prey. And we can see that it's, it's peaceably coming up in that it has two horns, not to fight aggressively with, but they're two horns like a what? A lamb. Now, the word lamb appears 29 different times in the book of Revelation, and every single time it refers to Christ except this time. This time it's a lamb-like horns, or a beast with lamb-like horns. And so the earth, where it comes from out of the earth, this peaceable animal, not attacking, but coming up out of the earth, we don't have a biblical phrase that actually says the earth means this in Bible prophecy necessarily. But we do know that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, Revelation says that the waters represent many multitudes of nations, peoples, tongues, etc., so water represents lots of people. The opposite of the water would be the earth. So we can say, we can deduce 
that the Bible refers to a non-populated area when it's talking about this beast, this nation coming up like a plant, peaceably in an unpopulated area. Now, it talks about these horns. If you understand what the Bible says in regard to horns, like in Daniel chapter 7, for example, horns can refer to nations as well. But what's interesting is in Daniel chapter 8, you have this animal with, uh, it's a ram, and it has two horns. It is a nation with two horns. And it, you can read about it in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. It's the ram equaling Medo-Persia. So each horn represents the Medes and the Persians. Okay, So it's a nation that has two powers together into one. And I liken that, uh, this beast also to that similar kind of idea. Because if you, if you can find it as quickly as I do, because I've marked my Bible, you go to Habakkuk chapter 3, and verses 3 and 4 says this about the horns. Notice, just listen carefully. God came from Timan, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, and he said, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as the light. Notice here. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. So what we can see is in Habakkuk chapter 3, there were horns coming out of his hand, and there in his hand was the hiding of power. And so we can deduce that you have horns in his hand, and that's where his power was. So horns represent power as well in symbolism or prophecy. So when you're looking at this beast here, you have this lamb-like, or this animal with lamb-like horns coming up out of an unpopulated area. It's springing up like a plant, and it's a nation. It's a nation that doesn't overtake its territory, but rather just comes up peaceably. And so this power here at the end of the verse, it says that it's uh, an animal with two horns like a lamb that what? Speaks as a dragon. So if it's lamb-like, and we know the lamb 28 out of the 29 times refers to Christ, then we can say this is a blasphemous power as well. Why? Because he is looking like a lamb or Christ, but he's speaking like the dragon. And who's the dragon? The dragon is the devil according to chapter 12 verse 9. But interestingly, according to chapter 12 in the first part, it's also Rome. Remember that? Rome was the power that was trying to attack Christ as he was born of the woman. We know the woman was Jerusalem, or the Jews, and then became Christian and ended up being chased of the enemy after the cross. And we talked about that in Revelation chapter 12. But what you can see is in Revelation 12, this beast power, the dragon, he had two phases. He had the pagan and the papal. And so here you can see that this, this nation coming up peaceably in an unpopulated area that looks Christian, two horns like they're Christian, but speaking like a dragon, you can say that speaking like a dragon is both Roman and demonic or devilish, okay? You can see that just from Revelation chapter 12 in and of itself. So now, <clears throat> in verse 12, notice what the Bible says. He, he exercises some power, and we're going to see what kind of power it exercises. Verse 12. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, so he's a nation that springs up with Christian principles or looking like Christ. He's speaking like the devil. He's exercising all the power of the first beast before him. Who's the first beast before him? We looked at some of the characteristics that identify the Antichrist power. We came to the conclusion, using the Bible, that it is the Roman Catholic Church combined with the civil authorities, okay? The papacy. The papacy during the 1260 years is the power that this nation is going to exercise all of its power uh, from, okay? It's going to exercise the same kind of authority or power. If you know what the Bible's saying, which we will understand better by the end of today, that's a little frightening. Because, of course, the power that Rome exercised through the church, with the civil and uh, religious powers joined together, 
was just as it always is in the Bible example, it leads to persecution. Okay? You can see all the church state scenarios always lead to persecution. For just a few examples, when you look at Esther, you have, remember, Haman. He was the one that was a civil authority that wanted worship, was he not? And he was combined with a king who was deceived into believing that the group that Haman hated was the, the people that needed to be wiped out in what we would call genocide, wipe out the entire nation. And so this deceived king and this civil authority that wanted worship were specifically against Esther and Mordecai. Okay? There was persecution that was a, as a result of the church and state union. What about in Daniel chapter 3? Daniel chapter 3, by the way, is a very, very descriptive experience, very similar to this one. We'll talk about it a little later as well, hopefully. It's in the notes, if not. But um, Daniel chapter 3, you have a king in a civil authority that wants worship. You bring those two things together. What happened in Daniel chapter 3? The three faithful Hebrews, not Daniel, he was probably on some trip doing business, but he, those three, those three faithful Hebrews, were persecuted. They were thrown into the fiery furnace, were they not? What about in Daniel chapter 6? Darius wanted to have, as a civil leader, his princes, uh, he, he liked the idea that his princes came up with some laws, and the laws were specifically religious in nature. What did this civil and religious power combined do? They persecuted Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. Remember that? What about in the days of Jesus, when the Jews threw aside their uh, total surrender to the king of heaven, and they said, we have no king but who? Caesar. When the Jews came together and united with the civil powers, they, what, persecuted Jesus Christ, didn't they? Same thing that happened in the Dark Ages, what we're talking about, where the church of, of uh, the Catholic system and the state, if you will, or the civil authority of Rome came together. They persecuted 50 to 75 million Christians. Terrible, terrible history. Anyways, this verse right here, verse 12, says that this beast power, okay, the second beast, the one that comes up out of the earth peaceably, that, that springs up, doesn't take by force its position, the one that has Christian principles, it will have worldwide authority. And it will have the same kind of power that we can see in that amazing book that if you haven't read, you've got to pick it up and read it today, The Great Controversy. You see, that book explains the history of what we're talking about here. And so when it describes that this, this power is, for one, a nation, two, it fought no wars coming into power, three, it started an, in an unpopulated area, and four, it's a nation with Christian principles, number five. It came up while the previous beast was going into captivity. We know that because it says that uh, whose deadly wound was healed. And it, in verse 12 where it says that all the power of the first beast before him, he exercised all that power before him. The word before means in the presence of. It doesn't mean um, uh, chronologically before. It actually means in the presence of. So if I'm before you or standing before you and speaking with you, that's what it means. It's in, the, it's in the presence of or in the sight of. That word before is used three times in this chapter. Twice it's in the sight of. Right here it's before. So anyways, <clears throat> that's the fifth one I think came up previously with the beast going into captivity. And six, I'll keep one hand up here for number six, it has worldwide influence and uh, is able to fulfill global predictions of this prophecy. And number seven, it will unite church with state, exercising the same power of the first beast before it. The United States of America, did it come up peaceably? Did it spring up slowly like a plant? Did it come up when the other beast was going into captivity? Did it come up in an unpopulated area? Does it currently wor uh, exercise worldwide authority? Absolutely. Will it in the future unite church and state? Unfortunately, yes, it will. And it will exercise all the authority or power of the beast before it. Why? Because we can see at the end of this portion that we're going to talk about, the first beast and this beast, America, are going to join forces. We're going to have Catholics and America, Catholicism being the church, America being the civil authority, 
they're going to come together and they are going to cause the world to worship. Again, again, it's going to happen just like in Daniel chapter 3, where they are trying to combine the civil authorities with the religious powers together for the purpose of worship. What will be the outcome? Of course, Christ will be with his people as they are persecuted. Okay, do you understand that? This is something we've got to understand as Christians. It will not be a smooth road until Jesus comes. We are going to face trials. The Bible calls it the time of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. There's a whole nother lesson in that. But So what we can see is um, this nation, America, is going to exercise all the power of the one before it. Um, that beast whose deadly wound was healed. That, that word was is important to focus on. See, America is going to cause all nations to worship the beast whose deadly wound was, past tense, healed. Okay? The wound that came to the Roman Catholic system was when the civil authority was taken from it and it continued as a church only. Okay? In 1929, we talked a little bit about the Lateran Concordat, and that was when there was a little bit of the world's civil authority given back to that power. When the worldwide authority, civil authority, is given back to this power, that's when we will see the complete fulfillment of this prophecy here at the end of verse 12, where it says, um, he will exercise all the power of the first beast uh, before him, whose deadly wound was healed. So when it is healed completely, that's when this prophecy is going to be um, fulfilling and then finally fulfilled. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, And he, that's this beast, America, doeth great wonders. That word great wonders is also translated miracles. So that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Same word as before in verse 12. So when it's talking about this, this power, a miracle will do great Miracles are wonders, okay? That, uh, that word miracle, the, the word, um, uh, let's see, great wonders, it's actually translated or used in the original Greek seven different times in the book of Revelation. You can study that on your own time. So the reason why he's doing this, why they're doing these great wonders or miracles, is, as it says in the first words of verse 14, and deceives them that dwell on the earth. You see? The purpose of the miracles here in North America that the enemy will actually do are going to be miracles that will deceive people. That's what the business is of the enemy. He's out to deceive. Now, these are not going to be just regular, like, trick-type miracles. These are going to be real things that are occurring, real miracles. We've seen some amazing things on television. There are some things that people are going, is that real? And there's a good chance it's not, because there's a lot of go uh, people that have skills in After Effects and green screening and that kind of, that kind of uh, technology that uh, can make you believe that something that looks really real is, but it's actually not. There's a lot of trickery. This stuff right here, I do not believe is going to be trickery. Okay? We can see a little bit about that. Turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 7 and verse 22. Exodus 7, verse 22. We're going to see an example of that kind of thing in these verses. Exodus 7, verse 22. This is when the water, I believe, was turned into blood. And so the Egyptians could not drink from that water. But notice what it says in verse 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. So... What happened is, in Exodus 7.22, God's people, Moses and Aaron, had made an actual miracle occur. Okay, God empowered them to make this miracle occur. Well, Pharaoh's like, okay, that's really cool, but check this out. And so what happens is his magicians come up and do the exact same thing. And as a result, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Okay? So there was an impersonation going on, wasn't there? There was kind of a, a, a like, nice trick, but we can do that too. And look at also, it says in chapter 8, verse 7 of Exodus, this is when the frogs came out. It says, uh, verse 6 and 7, I'll read. 
Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Verse 7, And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Of course, Pharaoh was then hardened again. And so why is the enemy doing these deceptions? Well, it's because he's trying to impersonate, for one, but also he wants to harden the hearts of those that do not believe the Holy Scripture. They'd rather see signs and wonders than have their hearts transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit with the foundation of God's Word. Okay? That's why people are going to be deceived is because they don't have a love for the Word. Now, what's interesting about Revelation 13 and verse 13 is you have these great wonders with fire coming down from heaven. Didn't Moses do great wonders and Elijah call fire down from heaven? Isn't it kind of the same thing as what we saw in Revelation chapter 11 where those two witnesses ended up being Moses and Elijah? And here we have this false Moses and Elijah working miracles and calling fire down from heaven. And so it's almost like an impersonation of the two witnesses that we saw in Revelation chapter 11. Except it's not God's holy word. It's a whole other thing. It's based on, uh, how would you say, miracles and false uh, impersonations and those kind of things. Because you see, this nation, America, will not lead people to understand fully the Holy Scripture. What it will do is it will wow people with deceptions and miracles. Why? It says in verse 14, he deceives them that dwell in the earth. So notice <clears throat> what it says in a book entitled Darkness Before Dawn. This is page 19 through 20. Many will be ensnared through the belief that spiritualism is a merely human imposture. When brought face to face with manifestations which they cannot but regard as supernatural, they will be deceived and will be led to accept them as the power of God. No mere impostures are here foretold. Men are deceived by the miracles which Satan agents have power to do, not which they pretend to do. You see, I think those are very clear and very powerful words. So now, America currently has a voice speaking to the entire world that they should make an image to the beast. The Bible says in verse 14, that uh, they are the ones that are supposed to be made an image, or making an image to the beast. Notice what it says in verse 14. So this, this beast, uh, America, he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they, the ones that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So they're working these miracles, excuse me, they're deceiving, and they have power to do in the presence or in the sight of the beast. So they're going to be working together, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Okay, notice what it says in that really powerful book I tell you about all the time, The Great Controversy, page 442. It says, when it's talking about they that make an image to the beast, it says, here is clearly presented a form of government in which the legislative power rests with the people. A most striking evidence that the United States is the nation denoted in this prophecy. Why is it they should make an image to the, uh, to the beast? Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Well, that's the voice of the people. Vox Pops, if you will. That is those that dwell on the earth having the ability to make decisions, okay? That's republicanism, isn't it? And so America is founded on these Christian principles of republicanism and Protestantism. Those are the two horns that are pictured on this beast coming up out of the earth. Republicanism and Protestantism. Those are the lamb-like. Those are the Christian principles or powers that this nation has. Republicanism being the, how do you say, the uh, state without a king, and Protestantism being the church without a pope. You see, coming over from England to this area, or from Europe to this, this uh, area, to this American continent, 
They wanted those exact same things. They wanted Christian principles. They wanted to base a nation on those foundational principles. We want a church without a pope. We want a state without a king. That's what brought them to this nation. That's what may, has made this nation, America, such an amazing place to be. But as we continue reading, it's not always going to be that way. That's the trouble of this section. That's what makes this very difficult to present, of course, because I love this nation. I've traveled to lots of places in the world, and people will say, oh, that's, that's interesting. What's your favorite place? And I'll always say, well, I like America. It's a wonderful place to be. Unfortunately, it will turn sour. This beautiful nation will speak as a beast. I'm sorry, as a dragon, which is a beast. But when a nation speaks, remember, we talked about this before. When a nation speaks, how do they speak? One of the greatest ways they can speak is by example. They will set up laws. If their laws are such, then you'll be able to point to that nation and say, yeah, well, that's who they are. That's what they represent. That's what they say over there. They have these laws. So not only will they enforce, or I mean make laws, but they will enforce them. And you can see that by um, the comments in verse 12 where it says, I'll just read that verse again, pointing that out. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So not only do they speak as a dragon or establish laws, they will cause people or enforce those laws, causing people to worship. So notice what it says in verse 15. The Bible says, and we'll continue, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, that's the writing of the laws, and cause, that's the enforcing the laws, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You see, there are going to be death decrees, just like there have been in all the church-state union examples that I referred to earlier. There's going to be a death decree against those who are faithful to God's holy word compared to those who are willing to surrender to the power of the nation. And so what's amazing here is that this beast will be able to give power, authority, the ability to live. When it says that he gave power, or he had power to give life, the word is breath, okay? The word life is breath. And so when you think about this for just a second, you realize that <clears throat> the nation, America, will have the ability to give breath or life to this image. Let's talk about that breath or life for a second. Um, when Jesus Christ in John chapter 20, I think I've got it written in my Bible here, verse 22, John 20, verse 22, he breathed on his disciples and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. You remember that? But what he's doing is he's giving life to the disciples. And what's happening is this nation, America, will also have the power to give life or breath to the image. Okay? How can he do this, and why will people believe? Well, remember the miracle of fire coming down from heaven? Remember that in verse, uh, let's see, verse, is it 13? Yeah, he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That idea of fire coming down from heaven is actually, biblically, it, it seems like a phrase that oftentimes shows the acceptance of God. Okay? For example... In Leviticus chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, Moses and Aaron had just finished dedicating the temple. What happens? Fire comes down from God out of heaven and consumes the, the offering that they had given. Okay? So what it showed was, when fire came down from heaven, is that God had accepted their offering. What happens in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 38, when Moses, I'm sorry, Elijah was up on the mountain, he was praying, God, take your Take this, this offering that I'm giving you compared to those that are in apostasy uh, that had been praying and cutting themselves for all afternoon. Remember that? Well, what happens is fire comes down from God out of heaven and consumes Elijah's sacrifice. The apostate group was praying and pleading and cutting themselves for that fire to come down. It wasn't coming down. 
But when it came down, it showed that God had accepted Elijah. What happens in 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 10 and 12, where Elijah is saying to um, Elisha, no, actually that hadn't happened yet. He was up on a mountain, and there was 50 that came with the captain, and they said, hey, we want you to come to our king. And what did Elijah say? Well, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from God out of heaven and consume you and your 50. Boom, it happened. And what goes on? Another group with 50 comes, with an, or another uh, captain with 50 comes. Hey, we want you to come over to our king. He says, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Boom, it happens. Because God was showing, I accept Elijah, not you and your civil authorities. And so what happens is, the third guy comes up and he says, hey, listen, I know who you are. I know what you've done, and I'm totally willing to surrender. Just work with me here. And so Elijah worked with him, and it happened that he was not consumed. But what happened in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1, where Saul got up off his knees, having prayed to God, fire comes down from God out of heaven, consumes the offering that Saul had presented. What did that show? God had accepted Saul's offering, right? What happened in Acts chapter 2? where all the children of the, the faithful after the uh, suffering and resurrection and ascension of Christ, what happened to them when they were together in one accord in Acts chapter 2? There was the sound of the rushing mighty wind, and then there was fire on their heads, right? Fire came down from heaven, if you will. So they had the Spirit. They had the acceptance of God. And what is happening here? The power of America, or what rather, America will be given power to give breath or life the Spirit, to this image. To show, as it, as it were, that God had accepted this, that the, the Holy Spirit, the fire coming down from heaven was proof, along with the ability to give life, that God had accepted this nation. And that's how they're going to deceive many people. Of course, they're going to be using spiritualism. Spiritualism is a very, how would you say, potent tool in the hands of the enemy. I don't think I have stories to tell right now because I don't think I have time, but there are many stories I could tell about spiritualism, manifestations, uncles visiting that had passed away or grandfather that had passed away visiting a home or people's children that had come back to their home, etc. These kind of things are spiritual uh, deceptions that I believe the enemy will use. And one of the ways he's doing that, one of the ways he's getting into churches so that he can invite that kind of spirit into their churches are things like spiritual formation, where you will be searching for God by shutting down your mind, entering into silence, being in quiet spots without contemplating God's word. As soon as you empty your mind and try to push out everything, guess who's going to be knocking on your door? The more aggressive one, which is the enemy. The Lord will knock, but if you don't want him there, if you're trying to push him away, he'll stand back. He's not coming in like a bulldog like the enemy does. So be very careful with what you're studying if it's not founded on the Holy Word of God. That's probably the, the most broad way I can address a lot of the issues that are going on in many churches today. So what we see in verse 15, though, is this nation, America, will be given the ability to give life to an image. What is an image? An image is something that looks very similar to that which is portrayed. For example, if you stand in front of a mirror, you're looking at an image, right? So this nation, America, will be able to make a replication of what has been done in the past. Notice what it says in verse 15 again. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast, that beast is chapter 13, the first one, should both speak, right laws, and cause, enforce those laws, that as many as would not worship the image, not God, but worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. Again, the same scenario. Killing those who are not willing to surrender to the dictates of their conscience. Verse 16. And he causes all, again in forces, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. America will cause by legal force all to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads. What does this mean? Well, all terms in this section are symbolic, okay? The beast coming up out of the earth, fire from heaven, 
We have all these things symbolic. The image, all of these things are symbolic. If the Bible gives them interpretations of symbolic terms. Okay, I think you understand what I'm trying to say here. So, what we have here is the right hand and the forehead. These also are symbolic. Many people will tell you that you're going to be given a stamp on your right hand or something on your forehead like a UPC code that people can scan. Oh, no, you've got the mark. Sorry, you can't be here. That's not what the Bible's talking about at all. You see, the hand represents your, what you do. The forehead represents what you think, your choices that you make. And we can see some of that in the Bible. In fact, in Exodus, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do with your might. Okay? What your hand finds to do, do it. Those are your actions. That was the, that's what the Bible says. And then, of course, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, we are told that the uh, 144,000, excuse me, will receive a seal on their forehead, the seal of God. They won't have a stamp that they're given from heaven. They will have the choices made that they will serve God and God alone. And it will be founded upon the Holy Word, right? Not upon just some ethereal experience. We're talking about understanding the Bible and making those decisions in concert with it. That's who's going to be receiving the seal of God. So now I want you to notice a couple of verses, though, in uh, Exodus chapter 13 and verse 9. If you'd like to turn there, I'm going to read a couple of verses in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 9. The Bible actually talks about that uh, <clears throat> the law will be on your hand and in your mind. Notice what it says in chapter 13, verse 9. It, the law, the words, shall be for a sign upon thee, upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, which would be your forehead, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And so what's happening is they, they're asking, like, well, what do we say when people ask us about this uh, Passover service that we're going to do? And that's, of course, what he's talking about. Tell them to your children while you're standing up, while you're sitting down, you're walking along the way, so that they can be as a sign in your hand and your forehead. Not that they were going to stamp each other and stamp their kids with a sign or, or some kind of symbol. No. It's referring to their ability to choose, and these are the actions that they've followed. So what it says in Deuteronomy, let's turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 8, You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Amen? And these words, which I command you this day, shall be in your heart. Now, I want to take a second. When he is saying the words that I command you this day, if you read the previous chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 5, it is a second rendition or a repeating of the Ten Commandments that God had spoken from the mountain in Exodus chapter 20. So now, notice verse five, uh, 6 again. It's important to understand. These words which I speak unto you this day shall be in your heart, verse 7, and you will teach them diligently unto your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you will bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they will be as frontlets between your eyes or on your forehead. So the law of God is going to be on your hand and in your forehead. That doesn't mean... You're going to wear what people wore in the past, which are, which are called phylacteries. You're not going to have the law of God actually bound to your hand and strapped on your forehead. I mean, you could, but that'd look a little weird. What you, could, what you can do, though, is practice God's word by making choices to be in concert with that word. And as a result, you have got the law of God on your hand and in your forehead, you see. So that shows by your own life and your actions that you have surrendered your heart 100% to the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments, is what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15. So now, in Revelation chapter 13, I want you to understand what's happening there. It says in verse 16, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. What is happening here is the nation that is trying because it's empowered by the devil. You've got to understand that. 
the nation, America, in the future, will try to dominate humanity so much that he will cause or be in the place of God, like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, showing himself that he is God, and he will want worship. And he will call everybody to surrender their works and their thoughts to him or it, the beast, the image of the beast, which is, of course, America and um, the papacy, combined together, wanting to rule all humanity. We know that's true because of the previous verse. Verse 15, if you don't worship, what's going to happen? You're going to be killed, okay? So, of course, they're going to want to fully work your mind, your actions. That's the goal of the one world environment. That's the goal of the new world order. And so, as it says there in verse um, 16, when he causes all to receive this right hand or forehead mark, this is the mark of the beast. Okay, this is what's being described here. The mark of the beast, it is, let me see if I can find this in my notes. Most will, I'll just read this. Most will either follow, which is receive the mark, out of ease or by choice. Okay, but there is a people who will not submit to any authority contrary to God's desires. I want to be one of those people, don't you? I want to stand up in the face of even persecution, just like Jesus did, saying, I will serve none other but the Father which is in heaven. In concert with the first study of Revelation chapter 7 in this series, which you can go back and watch or listen to, the mark is, listen up, the greatest sin portrayed that God's people are sighing and crying against that we read about in Ezekiel chapters 8 and 9. The greatest sin out of the four in Ezekiel 8 was turning your back to the sanctuary while you're in the sanctuary and worshiping the sun. Okay? That was the greatest of the worst abominations. And as a result of those sins, you can see in chapter 9 of Ezekiel, God's people were sighing and crying after the abominations that they had just heard about, I guess, in chapter 8, right? So, those people that were sighing and crying received a mark on their foreheads, and all the rest of the folk were destroyed by the angels that were sent by God. See? So in the same scenario right here in Revelation chapter 13, those that receive the mark of the beast will not have the seal or mark of God, and those are the ones that are going to be destroyed. I want a mark, but I don't want this one. I want the one in chapter 9 of Ezekiel, I want the seal of God or the mark of God on my forehead, which is the habitual choices based on the Holy Word to follow God's will above my own and above the civil and religious authorities around me. I want to serve God and Him alone. And yes, I do believe one day that will take my life. But I still want to do it because Jesus is my example. What about you? So it is worshiping the sun in the form of honoring Sunday in the place of God's holy Sabbath. This is what the mark of the beast will be. Some of you have scoffed. I, I've, I say some of you because I've, I've studied with thousands of people and I've mentioned these things and they're, oh, how could that happen? Listen, study your Bible as diligently as you can and just wait a while. You'll realize you'll see it happening. It's the, the, the evidences are already there. You can just look on the news and listen to the Pope today. Ve- right now, today, he's talking about causing Sundays to be the day of relaxation for the sake of those that are poor, for the sake of those that, um, are for the world as well, because we know that the, uh, what do you call this, the climate change and the, um, help me out, the global warming is actually causing the earth to, Uh, be destroyed quicker than we want. And so what would be a better time to cause families to be joined together to give those that are working all the time a little break so that families can be strengthened and also the earth can receive no flights, no driving, no factories. All this smoke will be stopped for a day. There will be rest. It will be good for the earth. It will be good for the family. It will be good for et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is being spoken of today on a global scale And they're referring to Sunday as that day to take this break. Keep studying your Bible and look around. This thing is going to happen, I 
promise you on the foundation of the Holy Word. Again, God's commandments show him as God and as the creator of both heaven and earth. Only in the fourth commandment do we see those specific terms. Worship God who made the creator. Heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. God who made the creator and his territory. The title, territory, and um, uh, I don't remember the other one. But anyways, I'll continue. It says, the only commandment that gives these specific things are the fourth commandment. The issue, according to chapter 13, verse 15, that we've been reading in Revelation, is worship in the end time scenario. It is worship. So some of you will say, well, how is this going to be over a day? Well, guess what? It says, you're going to be killed if you don't worship the image of the beast. Of course, it's going to be a time of worship. It's going to be a day of worship. And if you even just read the history of Jeroboam, he set up, he was an apostate king, he set up a new day of worship. He set up a new priesthood for worship. He set up all things that were so similar to everything God had. I think it's in, I think it's in First or Second Kings chapter 12. I don't remember which one. But you can go and read it for yourself. And what happens is Jeroboam sets up all these false systems. What did God do? He sent, of course, per, uh, judgment. So we can see all these things. My, my question is this. Have I given my life and its authority, or the authority over my life, have I given it to God or to man? Is it based on the Holy Bible, or is it based on the culture around me? I believe the culture around me will beg me to want to live and want to uh, keep alive, keep my job, keep eating, keep you know, clothed, but my religious convictions based on the Holy Word, will say, no, God is going to take care of me and feed me with bread and water just like he did Elijah in the wilderness when he was there. So I'm telling you, we've got to study, we've got to believe that these things are going to be happening. So now look at verse 17. Verse 17, no man, or so he puts this, right hand, this uh, mark on the right hand of the forehead, that no man might buy or sell except he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, you can find the words buy or sell in several different places in the Bible, but there is one place that is extremely important to understand. Let's go there very quickly, Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to see that there's an, um, a parable that Christ illustrates or uses to illustrate the end of time. Matthew 25, we're going to look at this very quickly, and we're going to see that in this parable, <clears throat> Christ talks about buying and selling. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins. They took their lamps, they went forth, they went to meet the bridegroom. Verse 2. Uh, the, five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. They that were wise took their lamps and, I'm sorry, those that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise, they took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now the oil represents the Holy Spirit. <coughs> all of them are claiming to be Christian. They're all waiting for the bridegroom. Bridegroom. But... Half of them actually have oil. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. Now, they don't just have the Holy Spirit because they've asked. They have the Holy Spirit in proof because their lives have been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. They have new lives. They have transformed characters. They are rejuvenated for the kingdom of heaven. They are prepared to live among holy angels. Okay, That's what's being described here. <coughs> and so what happens is, it says in verse 4, but the wise took oil with their vessels and their lamps, verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, he was waiting, he didn't come as they, they thought he would, they all slumbered and slept, every one of them, all ten, both wise and foolish. Verse 6, at midnight there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, all ten of them, they trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, hey, give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. Notice verse 9, but... The wise answered, saying, no, 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 sorry, we can't do that, lest there be not enough oil for us and for you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. The whole point here is there will be a time where you, the, the, the wise that have been transformed, they will not only not need to buy and sell, they won't go buy and sell partly because they can't. But there's another group that haven't been prepared for that time where you won't be able to buy or sell. And the faithful, all we can say to them is, hey, listen, 
I've got my character transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't help you with this. You haven't worked on it like I have chosen to do so. But you, there is something for you to do. Go to those who buy and sell. That's the only other option out there. And so the reality is in this parable is when that time closes where you're either going to live or die for the sake of Christ, if we're not ready, you're going to have to go and get the mark of the beast, period. That's it. There's no other option. That's why today is the day of salvation. We must understand now is the time for character transformation because that parable will be fulfilled to the letter. Now notice, it says in chapter 17 again in Revelation 13, you need a mark in your right hand or your forehead or you will not be able to buy or sell. Except those, there's three groups of people here. Those that had the mark, those that had the name of the beast, and those that had the number of the name. Notice, those that had the mark are those that follow out of ease. Now, these are just thoughts I'm coming up with because th there are those three groups. If you have a mark, you're, you're kind of going along with the system. If you have the name of the beast, the name represents character in the Bible. You can see that time and time and time again. Name represents character. They actually believe what they uh, have been told and they've been transformed into the character of the beast. And so those are the ones that actually believe what's happening. They're not just going out of ease. But then those that have the number of the beast, those are the ones that have calculated where they are. Those are the leaders in this system, the worldwide system. So I think there are those that are just going along with the crowd, those that actually believe what they're doing, and the leaders that know and have calculated where they're at. Okay, so that's what I think is happening there at the end of verse 17. But notice verse 18. Here is wisdom. By the way, that word wisdom is only used twice four times in the book of Revelation. Twice, it's for God. Twice, it is describing who the beast is or the characteristics of the beast. Um, that other one is in chapter 17, verse 9, and it talks about the beast. Here's wisdom, if any man want to know. Uh, the beast is the one that's sitting on seven mountains, or the woman, rather. And, of course, we know uh, uh, the, the Catholic Church sits on seven mountains. It's the city of seven hills. So that's just an interesting insight there. But look at verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count. The word can be calculate. Let them count or calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is 660, I'm sorry, 666. Or 603 score and six. So notice what it says about this. It's the beast that we're talking about and the image of the beast, okay? It's, it's his mark. And we're to understand by calculating a number. It's the number of the beast. We know who the beast is, according to Bible prophecy. It's the Roman Catholic Church. So it's the number of the beast, but it's also the number of a man, okay? Now, the number of a man can be interesting because look at chapter 15 real quick. Look at chapter 15 and verse 2. The Bible says in Revelation 15, verse 2, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them which had gotten victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. And it says, they stood on the sea of glass having the harps of God. So not only is it the number of the beast, it's the number of his name. Isn't that interesting? So the Bible has clarified, it has to be connected with the beast, it has to be the name of a man, or the number of a man, um, and it has to be the name, or the number of his name, okay? So follow along with me again, I'm going to say that again, just to make sure I said it correctly. <clears throat> it's the number of the beast, it's the number of a man, and it's the number of his name. If you find the beast and the man and the name of that man, or the beast and the most likely man and the name of that man, you've got a pretty good connection. And if you're able to find 666 in that, you pretty much nailed it, right? So one of the more um, obscure names for Catholic priests or the Pope in the past, and if you're interested, you can find this online. There's a study that a dear friend of mine has put together and it's available for just a very small price. But if you're interested to read more about that, you can find that there at, uh, on the notes by clicking a link. So if you find that on the Pope's Mitre, 
there is a name, Vicarius Philae Dei. You realize in Latin numerology, you won't use any other kind of uh, numerology because they spoke Latin in Rome, right? So you go to Latin numerology and you find out that Vicarius Philae Dei, Vicarius equals 112 Latin numbers, uh, Philae is 53, and Dei is 501. You add those all together, it's 666. So the number of a beast, which is the Catholic system, the number of a, na a man, which is the Pope, and the number of his name. You calculate all those things together, which is Vicarius Philae, the vicar of the Son of God, the one that represents the Son of God here on earth. You put all that together, 666. I think it's pretty clear. Anyways, it's in the notes. You can find that further. So notice, as we look at verse, um, well, continuing on in, in uh, the thoughts of this chapter, the second beast, <clears throat> or what the Bible calls the false prophet, and we'll learn more about that as we go into chapter 16 in the future, it can be illustrated by an Old Testament Bible story that has the elements of a nation, which is Babylon, causing all to worship an image, which King Nebuchadnezzar set up, on pain of death for dissension or not being willing to surrender. Find that story in Daniel chapter 3. There's a more detailed explanation at a link that I've got here. I did a whole series on the book of Daniel, the first six chapters. It's called The Three Angels' Messages in Daniel chapters 1 through 6, and it's found right there. You can click it and, and watch them online. I won't cover all those details because that's a lot to cover in just the last two minutes that I have. So, some may ask, how can the United States of America, a nation started by God and being helped to, or, or being a help to his people, how can that nation turn against God's people? Well, historic examples can show that there are many times in the past where that exact thing has happened. Notice Joseph, Esther, and Daniel. Joseph was used by God to lead the nation of Egypt through a famine, and that was a blessing to God's people. Later, Egypt came against God's people, which it was at the time of um, the children of Israel coming up out of Egypt. And as you can read in Exodus 14, 10 through 11, the children of Israel believed that was a death decree. Esther also was in a nation called uh, the Persians, or, -Persia, or Persia, rather. And Persia, after being blessed by God through Esther and Mordecai, ended up being, uh, the, the children of God ended up being persecuted by Persia. And we can see that in uh, that same book, Esther, the third chapter. And then, of course, Daniel when you learn about the Medes and the Persians, how God had raised up that nation to allow God's people to come up out of Babylon, um, that nation that was such a blessing that was actually part of helping God's people in the person of Daniel, he was one of the leaders there, he was, you know, the, uh, what do you call that, the, uh, well, he was one of the leaders. Um, that nation ended up bringing Daniel into the lion's den, direct persecution against God's people. All these nations were blessed by God and then later turned against God and persecuted his people. So my question is, if America was a safe haven for God's people coming out of Rome, and America, will America later become an image to Rome that will persecute God's people? I think the answer is yes. <laughs>